newly signed Finance Act 2019 has triggered a wave of increments in the cost of several items, including cars, alcoholic beverages, cigarettes, among others. For instance, prices of cars with engine capacities exceeding 1.5 litres have jumped by more than 1 million shillings. With the new law, vehicles running on petrol engines now attract excess tax of 25% up from the previous 20%, while those powered by the diesel are henceforth required to pay an excess duty of 35% compared to the previous 30%, which applied on models exceeding 2.5 litres engines, and 20% on smaller cars. Now, increments are also expected on the prices of alcohol and cigarettes by at least 15%. But people are crying foul on this. They're saying, we've been pushed to the corner. Why more taxes with the excise uh, uh, taxes? Uh, we have uh, also uh, one man here saying that... Um, that, that this is a typical case of government institutions ignoring the rule of law uh, because there was a directive, especially on this particular excess duty as it is right now, uh, that they should not implement it. But they defied this, they went full steam ahead and, and did it. And so they're saying the court has ruled that the status quo remains. What KRA is doing is illegal and sets a, a bad precedence. Uh, this is a Kevin uh, uh, Kenya uh, managing director really crying foul about this as well. There was a statement. Maybe we can react to this, especially in the manufacturing sector. I think uh, the people who've been uh, hit hard on this particular uh, sure. excess duty. Um, the issue of the excess uh, duty is a conversation that has been going on for, for a while. Yes. The proposal to have an excess goods management system started in about 2015-2016. And uh, for the last three or four years, we've been having a lot of conversations with both KRA National Treasury and the rest of government. Yes. And our main concern has been the cost of implementing the excess good management system. Because an excess tax is being collected. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, there's the stamp. Yes. But business is still supposed to bear the cost of setting up the system. Mm -hmm. So the machines are brought by the contracted company, but Industry has to put in place, whether it's internet connectivity, ensure that there's space for the machines to be set up, buy the stamps. So there's an additional cost. And our position has been that for a tax to be collected, we do not need to bear an additional cost. Mm -hmm. So this cost should ideally be borne by government if it's going to collect this tax. So it's a position we have had all along. KRA went live yesterday, and uh, immediately we had a lot of concerns from manufacturers because we had an assurance the day before that everyone was ready to go live. There was still also the concern, I think some people had gone to court and the court had said that the status quo should be maintained mm -hmm. and there was a debate, as anything legally is, on what that status quo means. means. Uh, there was the understanding that the status quo meant that they should not go live until the court gives a ruling on the 21st. But the system still went live because their interpretation of the status quo being maintained was different. But our main concern really is the cost of implementation and then how we are executing it. Because now it's gone live, but a number of people are still trying to ask for information in terms of the stamps. They don't have the stamps already. They're reaching out to carry on a lot of issues still that had not been fully addressed. So this is going to be a bottleneck. People are currently producing for the Christmas season, which is really one of those seasons where they expect a lot of demand. But for this week or next week, we'll be really stuck because mm. the implementation and the rollout is not going as smoothly as we are assured it would. And the cost issue has still not been addressed because in our conversations with KRA, we are told that it's a policy issue that only Treasury can address. So I think we need to really be considerate of business and look at what impact this is going to have at the end of the day. It's touted as something that's going to help in revenue collection, and that is something we appreciate. Mm -hmm. However, the cost should not be borne by the manufacturers. But looking at analysis by the World Bank, uh, it shows that the structures of the economy has changed you know, substantively in favor of the non-tax revenue rich sectors, such as agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, which has expanded uh, as um, a share uh, to the gross domestic uh, product uh, from 27.5% uh, uh, in 2014 to 34.2% in 2018. But what they're saying, while the agriculture accounts for about that particular percentile, that is 34.2 year, um, yes, uh, its contribution to tax revenue is just about 2.6%. Yes. Uh, maybe we should be focusing more on the manufacturing that accounted for 7.7% of, of, yes, of, of nominal GDP, but contributed 18.2%. Mm. 
that's, so, that's true. So we have it so skewed uh, as it is right now. This manufacturing sector is the highest contributor to tax revenue, despite only contributing about 7 or 8 percent currently to the, GDP. to the GDP. So there's a yep. big opportunity for value addition in agricultural sector because there's that aspect that it's still the largest contributor to the GDP, mm -hmm. but how do we turn our agriculture into value-added agriculture mm -hmm. so that we see more manufacturing happening from agriculture, which will then lead to increased GDP contribution. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, from the tax angle, because we are the largest contributor, we still get hit by more taxes. If you look at the finance bill, there are the positive things. I always say the finance bill is mixed for, for everyone because they are the good wins out of it, but mm. also the things that are challenges. Thank you. So, yeah. All right. Uh, Makfi, is there any guarantee that the higher taxation will actually automatically translate now to bigger revenue collections with well, this limping economy that we do have? It's very interesting you ask me that question because, mm -hmm. you know, number one, uh, I remember when... Um, the Finance Act of that particular, I can't remember whether it was two or three years ago, they raised the excise duty on, um, on cigarettes. And when I looked at the financial statements for the half year mm -hmm. after that, in fact, the Kenya government uh, collected less tax from BAT than they had before the price increase. And, you know, we can have an extreme case here. I remember when, you know, a senator used to cost 20 shillings a glass. Mm -hmm. And uh, the then CS decided to put a 20 shilling tax on that glass of senator. Now, because he was completely out of touch, you know, I actually asked a student at the University of Nairobi who's doing economics, look, if you put the price of this thing up, what's going to happen? You, she said immediately, we go for an alternative, which they did. They went to, for Chang'e, okay? Exactly. And we had this incredible outburst of people going blind and dying and so on. Now, that increase in price from 20 shillings a glass to 40 shillings a glass, it has the result that 9,000 bars closed down in Kenya, okay? 9,000 bars. 9,000 bars. He wanted to raise 6 billion uh, shillings in, in tax. He never raised it. East African breweries all decided, look, we are going to stop producing Senator. It was in volume terms, not in profitability terms, uh -huh. in volume terms, it was the biggest selling beer in Kenya. It was for the one inch. You can't buy it. If you want to buy a, a Senator or get a glass of Senator, you've got to go to Korogosho uh -huh. or Kibra or, you know, Mathari Valley. You can't buy it in a supermarket. It was for the one inch. Uh -huh. And this is where you have people in Treasury totally out of touch. Number one, with economics, okay? And number two, with the one in Shiwatu Kufu. They, to hell with them, you know? Now, what happened? It took two years. You know, the farmers who were producing sorghum for East African breweries, yes. they had no market. They were, they were producing something which had, they couldn't sell. Mm -hmm. So the point here really is, we go back to what Mr. Catoni was saying, yes. that, you know, here, we've got to think about the consequences of our actions. What is, is, are you really going to, uh, you know, raise that additional tax? Uh -huh. And very often the answer is no. And, you know, what is the consequence of manufacturing be bearing all these taxes? Yes. There's a company in the Samia Business Park, an American company, which says, we're moving out of Kenya. Uh -huh. We're going to Uganda. And that is happening. For the first six months of this year, our imports from these African countries were greater than our exports to those countries for the first time since, well, uh -huh. records were, began, were begun to be uh, 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 collected in 1999. Thank you. So we are becoming uncompetitive. And we're going to kill manufacturing in Kenya if we do what these people are, are, are suggesting. Geoffrey, is this a, you know, flying in the face of the ease of doing business? Absolutely. Just uh, coming, uh, you know, closer <laughs> to the heels of the ease of doing business. <laughs> but yeah, please, very clear. Costs remain one of the key considerations when you talk about ease of doing business and cutting across various types of costs. And I think taxation <coughs> is a critical area to be looked at. Um, if we are going to have uh, a competitive edge, we've got to be very competitive on costs. I think some of our sectors have actually misperformed because of the cost of production. For instance, if you look at the sugar sector, we can't compete even with the region 
because our sugar costs are very high. So we really have to be conscious of the whole ecosystem, as Mapia said, because w they have very heavy dependencies on each other. And he's just talking about Senator and how the farmers are affected, the, 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 the factories that are producing are affected, and the whole ecosystem then gets affected. So we really have to be conscious about the cost because that's a very, very fundamental mm -hmm. input in production. So we, I, I totally agree it, it can affect the ease of doing business here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interestingly enough, uh, you know, the government is all the care is really quick off the mark to actually, you know, uh, put all the stamp duties, uh, get your taxes, but when it comes to now uh, refunding back the VAT, they're really slow off the mark. And people are really crying foul on, on this as well. For the longest time, the VAT has not been refunded. So, when I say, I'm You know, who's going to be a lot of people. But he's not vuviering yeah, anymore. Yeah? One, of the <laughs> positive, really concerned. Yeah? one of the positive things in the Finance Act is the reduction of the withholding VAT from 6 to 2%. Yes. Okay. Because it actually led to a pileup of uh, refunds because Correct. of that. Yeah. They've also reviewed the VAT refund formula. Mm. Because the formula that has been in place for almost the last 2-3 years was also leading to the pileup of those refunds. So we hope to see a reduction. However, the thing with refunds is KRA cannot pay the refunds directly. The money has to go back to Treasury and then they allocate it back to KRA. And the monthly allocation is lower than what needs to be paid uh, as refunds. So that piles up. Yeah. So that yeah. piles up <laughs> significantly. It doesn't come out. Somebody stuck somewhere in the Treasury. Yeah, there's some things so that I, I just get on record. This one is something that we've talked about for the last two years. The withholding VAT coming down to 2% and the issue of the refund formula. Okay. So if that can be addressed and then we see how we allocate more money to KRA to enable them pay or have a mechanism that they can offset from what they collect so that we reduce the back and forth Thank between you. Thank you. Treasury uh, keep and on. Um, Okay. Allow me to weigh in on this, uh, Debal. And it's very important what you've talked about, the, the, the topic you've just introduced on taxation. And I, I want to suggest that uh, let's broaden the conversation a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, according to me, we are faced with a trilemma, not a dilemma, mm. <laughs> a trilemma in this country. One is the issue of tax collection. We know that the government is facing a significant challenge in collecting taxation. The second aspect of the trilemma is the debt pressure. We, as a nation, you know, we've borrowed and we are at the ceiling of our, yes, of yes, our yes. borrowing. We know the Senate recently has expanded it to 9 trillion shillings, but that's not in itself a solution. And then the third aspect is government spending. And uh, Professor Ryan, I mean, <laughs> about uh, uh, the old issue of government spending and wastage. Um, this is all having the impact of really dampening the business confidence in our country mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also reducing the liquidity that's available. And if you look at, uh, I recently penned an article in the Business Daily yes. where I was proposing to the government that they need to come up with an economic stimulus to shore up uh, business confidence. And let's just go back to the basics of it. I mean, the overhead that, I mean, some of these problems were brought about by the new constitution. I mean, the, the governance structure that was proposed by the new constitution created multiple layers of governance. So that led to a very huge overhead. Secondly, it has, the, the, the Kenya Revenue Authority has moved from being a very stakeholder-facing organization. And we worked with KRA when I was in the chamber for a long time. They were a very stakeholder-facing, mm -hmm. progressive, um, engaged institution to an enforcement agency today that is just behaving completely unreasonably mm -hmm. in the face of the need to collect taxation and the demands that the government yeah. is making of them. Absolutely. A good example is the new finance bill that uh, Phyllis has just talked about. Uh, if you looked at the excise duty proposals, they said the effective date for the new taxation is 7th of November. And this was passed on the 7th of November. Mm -hmm. Many organizations will need to change their IT infrastructure to be able to conform to this new taxation. Have they been given a window to conform? Absolutely not. So what's going to happen is there will be a lot of uh, non-compliance in the short run that creates a huge problem for the Kenya Revenue Authority and subsequently also has an impact on tax collection. So we have a trilemma here. And I have been to many countries like Jeff has, uh, has been. And you know, in Kenya today, there's a lot of doomsday prophecying. People say we are going in a, we are in a crisis, the country is finished, etc., etc. And I can tell you for free, we are not in a crisis. We are not finished. Yeah. We have serious, significant short term challenges, yeah. but they can't be and fixed. What, they need, what it needs is a bold, a bold leadership to actually address the problem leadership. and fix the problem. Are we tittering I mean, on there to being I'll finished? You, I'll tell you one of the other problems that we have, again, brought about by the new constitution massive over-regulation. Mm. Yes, I'm, exactly. I'm involved in many businesses. Today, uh, I, I have some small hospitality businesses. We have nine different uh, sets of compliance. Mm. Many of them are duplications. Mm. In tourism alone, we have two compliances. Then we go to NEMA, then we go to county governments, then we go to the music copyright, then we go to the safety audits. So you have nine compliances. So for even small SMEs, what we are doing is just making it almost impossible for them to, to do business. 
I think to me, an economic stimulus is needed. We need to look at the issues that are making it impossible. Mm -hmm. You see, we might celebrate on the one hand that we have, as a country, been able to re reduce our ease of doing business index. But what is the reality on the ground? Correct. Are people doing business uh, in, a, in an easy Correct. fashion? Easy. And they are not. Correct. Mm -hmm. And you see, one of the things that I'm proposing in the economic stimulus uh, debal is, you see, many Kenyans have put an often credit rating, for mm -hmm. example. And this has been occasioned by perhaps gaming. Uh, it's been occasioned by perhaps delayed payments by government. Correct. And so many people today are listed in CRB, in fact, over one million people. Mm -hmm. And I'm proposing in the economic stimulus that maybe we should give these people one year to be able to clean up their tax records so that they have a chance to employment and they have a chance to do business and get access credit once again. We need to address the whole issue of liquidity, access to credit. Are we, do, are we creating an environment that enables businesses to be able to go and borrow from banks? And the answer is no. And so we need to give people a chance to get back Thank to you. clean up their credit. We need to uh, also have a setup system. We need a tax clearance house. So if you're owed money by government and you, ha and you have defaulted in your taxation, you should be given an opportunity to offset the two. Mm -hmm. So you don't go into default f due to no fault of your own. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think if we don't address the whole issue of business confidence, and Jeff mm -hmm. can tell you, yeah. markets are driven by confidence, we have a problem in the country. We have a problem. Yeah, let's hear from Mandugo. Yeah, uh, the issue of uh, generally, the, the, especially the tax and what uh, uh, Kitoni has said, Kenya Revenue Authority is a very critical body, especially when it comes to the issues of tax collection. And in fact, what I'm worried about is the debate that we had here the other time, whereby you have seen this abrasive form of tax collection, which is actually uh, driving business uh, away. And I think as a country, we may need to sit down and see what it is that, what is it that we can be able to do such that we are able to have a proper balance yeah? between the challenges that business is facing, the need to correct taxes, and also the, 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 the importance of managing our costs as a government. The moment we have that debate, and then we make sure that we have uh, stakeholders who are very keen and can be able to come and candidly discuss it, yes. and further we implement that with a very clear timeline implementation plan, then we are going to have a very good, um, uh, we are it will be a very good starting point mm -hmm. in trying to make uh, doing business ke in, ke in Kenya easy. Right, easy. But, but I wanted you also to just handle that particular issue of, you know, the government defying a court order. You know, absolutely, you know, it just flying in the face of what the court has said and you go and implement, now it is up and running. Yeah. Uh, it went live yesterday, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yet there's a court order here and people are crying foul. Why, if you are the government, why aren't you also respecting, you know, other arms of the government? Uh, not just that, I think even, yes. even tax tribunal rulings are being ignored. They're being ignored, yes. And you I see? Think, I think one of the biggest challenges we have, we have in Kenya is the question of uh, uh, our culture. Mm -hmm. We just have a very bad culture. <laughs> and this is impunity. <laughs> you have set up a very clean adjudication system. You have a very good uh, constitution that says, you have, uh, that says what you're supposed to do in certain circumstances. We have the issues of the rule of law. And, 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 and apparently, when you subject yourself to a court process, the assumption is that, and actually what you are obligated to do, is for you to comply with the orders that are coming from that particular court, whether they're favorable to you or not favorable to you. Because you'll be given an opportunity. Most of these interim, interim orders that the courts normal, uh, that normally issue, they are not just issued for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a case is ordinarily put in place whereby there is need to preserve the status quo to avoid immediate disruption. So that as at the time all the parties are given an opportunity to come and ventilate their issues before the court, yes. then the court will be able to weigh and give a, a, a way forward. Thank you. Now the challenge that we are having is that you have a government and government officials and uh, uh, whatever uh, the, 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 the people who are managing uh, key sectors of the economy, they have just decided to defy the court. Mm -hmm. And we have a very big challenge. The other time we had the, the, the back and forth about, about the, the role, maybe we have not really appreciated the role of the judiciary the role the judiciary plays in, when it comes to dispute <laughs> resolutions, especially in respect to how it affects the Thank life of, of Kenyans. Right. I think the moment we have that particular understanding, it is gonna to be, it's going to be a very good uh, aspect. Now, even when you're talking about enforcement of that particular court order, you may require police, the, the police to, to, to enforce. And at times it becomes very difficult for, 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 for maybe the police to really enforce against uh, certain people or certain personalities. And that's a challenge that we are having. Thank you. So I think it's a, cultural, it's a culture issue, and we need to, to have a conversation with ourselves and agree Get to, to abide by court orders. Uh, briefly, Onis. Yeah, I think the first thing you brought up a point, uh, Felix, thanks. I think she, you brought a very good point about uh, manufacturing. I think it's one of the drivers, and I keep asking my students, why was manufacturing 
chosen and by a big, the big four. And the connection with agriculture is spot on. Mm. But the second point I want to make, and I think if we're looking at the issue of taxation, we look at, want to look at it from a, a bigger perspective. Mm -hmm. Where do we get taxes from? Mm -hmm. By producing more. It's not going taxing people. Because yeah. when you produce more, and what does it produce more? Enabling environment. Mm. Because production will lead to savings, consumption, mm -hmm. investment. Mm. And I think that's the thing we need to grab with. The third one, I probably I quote, uh, uh, I think she writes in, in, in the newspaper on 23rd of February 2015, and Santa said, imposing taxes, in, imposing taxes is one of the most intellectually, and I emphasize the word intellectually, intellectually lazy the ways of generating income. So the moment we jump in to raise the taxes, we, we are not thinking. We're not thinking. Let's think about productivity. Mm. Productivity. We need to bake a bigger cake, then yeah. we can share it. Yeah, which is yeah. not uh, <laughs> getting any bigger anymore. Right.